Hello the world, hello the internet, hello Jason Isaacs. Uh, we're back with another video and uh, I hope you just caught my video on executive orders. Uh, we're now going to do a deep dive into one area where those executive orders are incredibly relevant. This is going to cover executive orders, legislation, the president, Congress, federalism, state governments, the constitution, the commerce clause, the supremacy clause, SCOTUS cases by the bucket, and this is going to help you understand American politics and hopefully give you something to think about. It's a really fun little exercise because we're going to look at drugs and how America gets itself in the right old tiz about some of these simple things. Mind you, having said that, I think they're probably in a better place than us at the minute. But remember kids, don't do drugs and I'll see you in the video. See you in a minute. Uh, yeah, so we're back with uh, an attempt to explain uh, American drug policy and perhaps um, more importantly how you can use uh, this uh, in the exam because it, uh, it covers an awful lot uh, of bases. Um, we're going to start off with where we are really at the, in the minute and um, you know all the way through the, the important thing to think about here is you know what does this mean for federalism? What does this patchwork of drug policies uh, mean for federalism. Well, frankly, it means that federalism is working and the United States has a peculiar relationship uh, with controlled substances. But um, all the way through, what, how are you going to use this? Well, you're going to use this when you're talking about uh, federalism in practice and uh, how you get uh, to that point. Now, it starts off uh, with the very opposite of uh, federalism. We have the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, of 1970 and this was passed uh, on the Commerce Clause and on the Supremacy Clause and the General Protection um, Clause so um, there is nothing in the Constitution uh, about drugs and you know this there's a there's a nice story that it was written on hemp paper uh, one of the original drafts might very well have been uh, but the uh, the actual copies of the Constitution that we have uh, in the various libraries around the uh, around the world are written on uh, proper parchment um, so uh, yeah, nothing in there about drugs, literally. Um, what that means then is the 10th Amendment, you know, that whereof the Constitution is silent, the states may speak. Uh, that should, in general theory, be uh, the domain of the state. You know, that is police policy. Are you going to smoke drugs in this kind of state or not? That should really be uh, the domain of the states. But the federal government, for reasons long and complicated that I don't really plan on getting into here, um, decided to pass the Controlled Substances Act in 70. Uh, that huge overreaching legislation uh, whereby Congress created the mechanism of control, but then interestingly gave the president the right to uh, control the scheduling uh, through executive orders. We're back on executive orders again. Um, so how could they justify that? Well, they justified it, as I said, particularly under the Commerce Clause, the idea that if you've got that patchwork of, uh, of cannabis laws or drug laws generally, then you're going to have commerce between the states and as a result of that the uh, the federal the federal government has uh, jurisdiction in that area and that was upheld um, in numerous cases but I think probably the single most important one for you is uh, Gonzalez versus Reich in 2005 um, California at the cutting edge decides to decriminalize uh, medical marijuana uh, challenged straight away by the federal government so the federal government took them uh, to court um, claiming the supremacy clause um, and the legitimacy of the control and uh, the, the, the Commerce Clause as a, as a validation uh, for that. Now, this was pre-Alito, you know, 2005. This was just before Alito uh, joined the court. And so what we have is um, we have a 6-3 uh, uh, split. And um, Kennedy, of course, uh, being one of the winners in this, as, uh, as in so many. But the interesting thing for here, the, the, the interesting thing you might find here is, is, is Clarence Thomas uh, sitting out there as an outlier. And the, the reason really there is that uh, Thomas was in an interesting position. He, he had to try to reconcile his natural conservatism, in other words, people shouldn't do drugs, uh, with his natural inclination to uh, grant power to the states. Uh, to uphold state rights, uh, particularly on the concept of originalism, that being that you know, there's nothing, you know, we, we have to try to intuit what the Founding Fathers would have wanted. And he said that the Founding Fathers wouldn't have given tinkers whatever about uh, drug laws 
Um, and so uh, on this occasion, interestingly, he went with the uh, libertarian uh, side. However, we had a 6-3 progressive, that is liberal majority, who believed that doing drugs was probably a bad idea. They weren't quite ready for this. And so we have a 6-3 uh, finding from the Supreme Court striking down Gonzalez, uh, sorry, striking down the uh, Californian uh, legislation uh, as it being incompatible with the uh, federal legislation and the federal legislation being justified uh, under the Commerce Clause. Uh, again, watch Kennedy there. He uh, changed his position later, um, but we'll, we'll get to that. Right. OK, so chapter one, Gonzalez versus Reich. We've got California trying to decriminalize medical marijuana. The government saying we're not happy with that, taking that to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court finding for the government saying, well, if the government wants to uphold the Controlled Substances Act, well, you know, that's the government's uh, prerogative. And so, uh, yeah, crack on. So um, interesting little uh, thing there, but you've got that 4-3. Uh, with the uh, progressives on one side and Scalia, Scalia uh, joining uh, over there. Anyway, that's uh, for the Supreme Court. Okay, next phase is that over two, from 2009 onwards, we see a slew of ballot measures uh, in each of the states, uh, in, in, or rather in many, many states, um, asking the people, would you like to decriminalize marijuana? Now, the way a ballot measure works is when you go into an election, and remember, you will go into an election at least every two years because your representative is going to be uh, up for re-election. Uh, when that happens, the um, if you, depending upon the structure of your constitution uh, in each state, you can uh, raise a ballot measure, and that is essentially a rolling plebiscite or a rolling referendum. So if you get a sufficient signatories, you can get these onto your ballot measure. And so uh, when you vote, you will have you know, your, your representative ballot, your, your, your representatives uh, to vote for. And then on the other side of that, you'll have a whole list of um, referendum questions, essentially. And uh, from 2009, many, many states introduced ballot measures uh, asking people if they wanted to decriminalize marijuana and indeed other drugs. You know, in, in Maine, essentially, if I remember correctly, uh, essentially everything uh, has been decriminalized. So um, why does this matter? Well, this is, again, that ongoing um, idea in America where democracy has primacy, you know, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The, the, the governors, the governments are instituted to protect these rights even. This is what it says in the uh, Declaration of Independence, remember, that to protect these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Well, here we go. The, uh, the governed are saying, well, look, we want to decriminalize marijuana, the, the war on drugs, we're, we're losing. So let's try a different approach. Um, and of course, this is being done on state by state by state basis. Um, and they were straight up saying, right, well, I guess we're going to have another bash uh, at uh, the Gonzalez uh, decision. So remember, Gonzalez was in 2005. And if the Supreme Court hands down a decision you don't like, there's really very little you can do about it other than wait for the Supreme Court to change, wait for times to change and then have another go. Now, you could try to change the Constitution, but of course, good luck with that because you need two thirds of both houses, 75 percent of all the states. It's going to be much quicker just to wait and see what happens. The Supreme Court is going to change in its nature. The prevailing mood of the population may or may not change. The Supreme Court is not bound to take in uh, what the people are thinking you know, out on Main Street USA, but it's not like they can avoid it. So when you have uh, an issue like this, then you wait and see what happens. That's what's happened with every big case that we've seen so far. You know, if you look at Plessy versus Ferguson, take that all the way through to Brown, uh, you can see how the Supreme Court will change its decision. Uh, Roe v. Wade to Dobbs. And here again, we've got Gonzalez versus Reich into the next phase where people say, OK, well, look, we've, we've given it four or five years. Uh, let's have another go. So what we have is all of these different states deciding that they're going to decriminalize marijuana. Now, if you remember from my uh, video on executive orders, when Obama passed his executive orders for DAPA and DACA, he wasn't changing the law. He was simply changing the way in which the law was implemented. He was instructing his immigration officials to deprioritize cases that involved children who were at school and essentially functional members of society, even if their parents had come in illegally. He wasn't granting them status. He wasn't changing their legal status. He was giving them a temporary waiver, effectively, and the right to work. Um, so in that instance, Obama sent that instruction to 
his employees, two people who work for the federal government. In that instance, it was ICE, the immigration control people. In this instance, he sent an instruction to the DEA. And he said, if you've got a state where they have, by popular plebiscite, decriminalized marijuana or other drugs, we just don't go there. So the Controlled Substances Act was still very much in force, but Obama instructed his officers not to enforce it in states that had, by popular plebiscite, legalized marijuana or indeed other drugs. So this is again another really good example of the way in which the president can control the executive branch and the way in which they can use executive orders to try to get their agenda across. So they're not changing the law. Remember, presidents can't change the law. Only Congress can change the law. Um, and we have a situation whereby states have decided that they want to change the law in their states, even if that is uh, clearly incompatible with the Controlled Substances Act. But they were going to roll the dice and see what had happened because we were four or five years uh, post Gonzalez. We had a new Supreme Court. Things felt different. Things looked different. So states decriminalize their legislation. Obama decriminalized marijuana, the drugs. Uh, Obama instructs the uh, DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, not to uphold the Controlled Substances Act in those states that have done it and critically as well, where suitable measures are in place to stop people coming cross state and buying drugs when they're not a resident of that state. So, um, for instance, in uh, if you were in Connecticut, uh, you were not able to go to Maine. Uh, Maine had decriminalized uh, marijuana, but you couldn't go from Connecticut to Maine uh, and buy your drugs there. Um, if you lived in Maine, then yeah, crack on. Um, but you couldn't uh, buy those drugs if you were from outside the state. And of course, remember that in the United States, all driver's licenses are issued by states. And so you would be expected to be able to present uh, proof of residency uh, before you could buy uh, any prescribed drugs. So um, that was how they got around the control. So that's how they got around the uh, Commerce Clause, because you know, the, the state had to have specific measures in place to prevent um, uh, commerce between the various states. So where that was in place and where you had a popular plebiscite that had decriminalized or then instructed the state government to decriminalize drugs, Obama decided they were going to have a hands-off uh, policy at the federal level. Well, of course, the next thing that happens is the Nebraska backlash. Uh, Colorado turned out to be the test case. Uh, Colorado was one of the first states to go through the whole process, not necessarily the first ones to have the ballot measures, but uh, the first ones definitely to uh, introduce uh, a relaxed um, uh, cannabis regime into the civil state. So they changed the laws of the state. They changed the way in which the civil state was shaped uh, at that point. Uh, and straight away, um, Nebraska and Oklahoma, um, that, by the way, that little bit there, is Oklahoma, just that little um, uh, salient uh, there effectively. That's uh, Oklahoma, but that was sufficient for them, they said, to have uh, skin in that particular game. And so Nebraska and Oklahoma, and I can't remember which other one it was, uh, but they definitely took um, uh, Oklahoma to court. And because disputes between states go uh, straight to SCOTUS, that's one area where they have what's known as original jurisdiction, this case went uh, straight into the federal court system and very, very quickly wound up with uh, on the desk of the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court gets thousands and thousands and thousands of petitions uh, every year. And um, in order for the Supreme Court to hear the case, they have to decide that it's worthy of their time. And uh, that is essentially a subjective call based upon precedent, based, in case, based upon uh, what the uh, prevailing mood is at the time, how big, a, how big a ticket is this, how long has it been since the uh, Supreme Court considered uh, one of those. And the Supreme Court basically sat on this for 16 months and thought about, are we going to look at this case? Now, if the Supreme Court is going to look at the case, then it is held that they are going to grant it certiorari, certiorari, sorry. That is, the Supreme Court will make certain. So if the Supreme Court is going to consider a case, they will say we are going to grant 
you certiorari. So 16 months the Supreme Court sat on this petition before it went, nah, I don't think so. So the Supreme Court refused certiorari in 2016. They said, we do not want to look at this. As far as we're concerned, you know, we have a working model here. We've got states doing what states want to do. We've got uh, measures in place preventing um, cross-border trade or cross the interstate commerce. So uh, the federal government is not obliged uh, to get involved. Um, and we are just going to let states get on with it. You know, this is state rights. Interestingly, uh, Thomas switched sides, Kennedy switched sides, uh, and we wound up with this 5-2 decision. Um, it's really, I, I find it fascinating. But the, the, the key thing here is, you know, we, we have the, the, the Supreme Court uh, finding for the states, we're going to look state rights, uh, presumably somewhere in the back of their head, they've got the idea going that, you know, the war on drugs ain't winning. Um, and um, let's try something else. And obviously it has proved to be uh, remarkably uh, successful. So this is called judicial restraint. You know, let it stand, stare the ceases. The Supreme Court is backing off. A lot of people get tied up with judicial restraints and whether it's progressive or whether it's conservative. It's neither of those things. It is the action of the Supreme Court going, nah, we're just going to let that one go. Star aid the thesis, let it stand. Sometimes it's progressive, sometimes it's conservative. So judicial restraint here, they had the option of striking that down or saying, no, you can't do that. But they didn't. They exercised restraint. They said, no, star aid the thesis, let it stand. We are not going to get involved. And that is judicial restraint. On this occasion, progressive restraint. So when you're looking at uh, your cases uh, with SCOTUS, remember that restraint and active uh, and uh, judicial activism, they can both be uh, progressive, they can both be conservative. It depends what agenda they're, they're ending. The key thing is, if the judges are being active, what they're doing is they are striking down. So had the courts in this instance struck down Colorado's position, that would have been judicial activism. We're saying, no, you can't do that. We're striking that down. On this occasion, they said, no, we're going to let that stand. Star aid the ceases. Let it stand. Uh, that is judicial self-restraint, extreme self-restraint. In this occasion, because they didn't even view the court, they didn't even look at the case, or rather, they didn't even pass judgment on the case. They said, "No, this is fine. Colorado's doing its thing. That's layer cake federalism. Uh, federal government's doing its thing up there. The individual states are doing their thing down there. That's how federalism is supposed to work. We're not going to impose one side fits all because it's not in the Constitution. You can't do it. You know, there, there, there is no justification in the Constitution for one size fits all." when it comes to uh, drugs. And in fact, you know, if you take your privacy and your Griswold versus Connecticut in 65, then arguably there's a case for individuals being allowed to do uh, whatever they like. And um, yeah, interesting. So chapter five, we have this extreme restraint, the Supreme Court not getting involved and letting the states get on with it. So what does this mean? Well, again, here we see a judicial extreme uh, restraint and particularly them coming down on the side of state rights. Uh, on this occasion, the the uh, the federal government was on the same side. So remarkably, you know, it's all um, everyone seemed to be stacking up on that particular side of the equation. It would suggest that federalism is alive and well. There we go, states rights. Uh, the relevant to Pisces. Remember Pisces, the power clauses, interstate commerce, elastic supremacy. Those are the areas of conflict within the Constitution where federalism inevitably winds up in SCOTUS. And uh, one, little, one little thing, I can't find um, the exact mechanism by which Obama sent this instruction to the federal bureaucracy. I can't find uh, a specific exhort. I can't find a signing statement. Well, it's obviously not a signing statement, but I can't find a presidential proclamation or anything. Clearly, it's out there somewhere. If somebody does find it and you've made it to this far in the video, well, thank you very much. Um, do let me know because I'm very, very keen uh, to find out. Um, two little bits of follow up. Uh, Trump, uh, the tangerine baboon, uh, was going at one point to reverse this. He claimed he was going to uh, uh, reverse the uh, the Obama policy. But like many things that Trump said he was going to do, he never quite got round to it. Um, again, 
one has to imagine that President Trump has um, at least a passing familiarity uh, with controlled substances. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm merely speculating here. Um, but he, as with many of the things that he found himself doing, he he um, sought the uh, sought the approval of the very conservative right in America. I don't know. Uh, anyway, he was uh, going to do something about it, but then uh, nothing happened, and um, then he left. In came Biden, and Biden said, "Actually, no, we're going to take this a stage further." And so we have further policy shifts uh, under Biden. Uh, remember that federal pardons. That is within the gift of the presidency. That's one thing he can do. And so uh, Obama issued federal pardons for anyone who had been jailed for uh, possession. And he then urged uh, state governors to uh, to do the same. Um, so again, federalism, it keeps coming up. Um, he promised a review of marijuana scheduling. As far as I'm uh, aware, that hasn't happened yet. But he did say that he wasn't exactly going to throw out all of the regulation. He was going to reserve the right to get involved in that. So um, there you go. So much there that's useful in the exam. We've got the Supreme Court. We've got Congress. We've got the president. We've got various presidents. Uh, we've got executive orders. We've got legislation. Uh, we've got the supremacy clause. We've got the uh, we've got the commerce clause. We've got cases by the bucket. This is going to help you not just write your essays, but also to understand the very strange way in which all these various different parts of the American political system come together. And uh, I hope it was helpful. Um, comments in the uh, in the box, of course, love to hear them. Really appreciate the feedback. Uh, like and subscribe, tell your friends, and uh, let me know if there's any area you want me to cover, and I'll see you in future uh, videos. Thanks for your time, and good luck with your politics. Hope to speak to you soon. Bye now.